Hello everyone, today is Thursday, July 27, 2017, and this is the week in charts. Well, obviously, I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. I appreciate you being here, so thanks a lot. So what do we talk about? Well, obviously, we talk about current market conditions, as we always do. Your questions on trading. If you don't mind, just because um, my ADD will kick in, uh, keep your questions relative to what's on the slides, and then I'll open it up for general questions further into the show. Uh, your favorite stock picks. Wait until we get to the charts before we do those, and that's for your benefit. And also ask about one stock at a time and then hit enter. And you can ask about as many stocks as you want, but for your benefit, ask about one at a time. That way I can delete it after I talk about it and don't accidentally delete all your picks. So what are we going to talk about? Well, I think this week we're going to talk more about more on what you need to hear versus what you want to hear. Last week, as you know, I did a presentation on psychology. It was kind of a warm-up for another psych, uh, psychology presentation that I was doing later in the day. And somebody new to the presentation came in and was like, are you just going to talk about psychology? Is all you ever talk about psychology? And I'm like, no, we talk about a lot of things here. And, and I have plenty of other YouTubes out there. If you're interested, you can check my website under videos. And the person soon left. Well, that just serves as a constant reminder that there's a big dichotomy between what you want to hear and that's set up, set up, set up, set up, set ups, methodology, however you want to look at it, and what you need to hear. And what you need to hear is money management psychology and methodology actually in a lot of cases comes later. Once you get your attitude right, then the methodology just kind of falls into place. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or, as I often sum it up, all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So, again, let's talk about what you want to hear versus what you need to hear. Now, lately, and I'm not sure if this is because this will probably be my next huge project. I'm not sure just yet. I should probably be happy that I've completed this two-year project with this trading full circle and take a break. I'm not wired exactly that way, so maybe psychology is going to be the next thing that I tackle. And I have been reading a lot of trading psychology books, and anytime I begin – reading a book on trading psychology, I always ask myself, why is it that something that seems so simple, so hard? And if you think about it, we're just trying to capture a trend. We're just trying to get on a trend and ride it and make a little money. And if you look at a chart especially if you look at a chart that was in a longer term trend, in hindsight, it sure seems pretty damn easy. But in reality, a lot of times it's not. The Russian proverb comes to mind, the elbow is near, we try to bite it. Now, I'm often reminded of what my wife tells me as I've written about and talked about extensively. I'm fairly mechanically inclined. I could do electrical work. I could do some plumbing. I could weld a little bit. I'm, I'm an okay welder. I'm a pretty good grinder, which is an old bad welding joke. But I have developed this set of skills, and it's taken me many, many years to develop. And it's something that I really had to work hard at, especially early on. Well, my wife either has this overconfidence in me or underestimates the job, but a lot of times there is a honeydew. And to those of you who aren't in the United States familiar with that term, 
that's honey can you do this means that something that your wife gets you involved with and usually it's always a lot more difficult on the surface on the surface it looks pretty easy hey can you fix this pipe or whatever the case may be and as i've written about before usually three or four trips to home depot or the plumbing supply company and i have to go buy some new tools and end up soaked and wet eventually I'll get it fixed, and in worst case, I'll have to phone a friend, or in a really bad case, I'll just call in a plumber. My time is a lot more valuable than that. I'll come to that realization. But usually, I won't come to that realization because my ego won't let me. And I think my wife goats me a little bit in this. So it always, on the surface, seems a lot easier than it is in reality. Now, speaking of plumbers, unlike doctors, lawyers, and automatic transmission mechanics and plumbers, there's no clearly defined career path when it comes to trading. And this is something I've been thinking about quite a bit as I wrap up this course that I've been working on for the last couple of years. And I'll come back to that in just a second. So just for S and Gs, I poked around the net today. I did a quick Google on what would it take to become a plumber. Uh, we have a friend of ours, and he was in a really tough business. And I don't want to go into any details into that, but he was coming home one day after something in, that involved a small child, and he was very upset about this. And he just didn't really think he can go through another one of these emotional round trips. And he decided to make a career change. And he decided, I'm not sure why, but he decided he was going to become a plumber. So a few weeks later, we had a plumbing issue, and my wife didn't want me to tackle it, I guess. And we call him up. I'm like, hey, you're a plumber now. And he's like, no, no, no. It's not quite that easy. I'm not even a journeyman yet. And I'm like, well, what's that? And he explained some things to me. So anyway, this morning, knowing that there is a process involved, I poked around the net. And this is what I found. After two to three years of education or apprenticeship, plus another year or two of plumbing experience, you can become a journeyman plumber. After another one to five years of professional plumbing experience, depending on the state, you are eligible to sit for the master plumber exam. Well, I don't know the exact process, but I know that there is an apprenticeship called a journeyman, and I know you have to get licensed and then at that point, then you can hang your shingle and call yourself a plumber. So it's a very detailed process on something that you might not think would be that involved, but it is. And if you've ever done any plumbing, you know that it is. <laughs> now, I'm just going to gloss over this quickly because this is a reoccurring theme and I've covered it at nausea. In fact, I covered it quite a bit last week. But as human beings, we're just not made to trade on a psychological level and on a physiological level level and the same things that are keeping you alive on a physical basis and making you successful in life from a psychological basis can be very detrimental to your trading and as i talk about quite often we can't make any decisions even what we're going to have for lunch as i say quite often without involving some emotions and that's the amygdala in our brain the so-called lizard brain the limbic system this very primal part of our makeup without using this tiny little brain. The little brain controls the big brain a lot of times. And that could get you into a lot of trouble. Let's say your wife says something and you snap right back. Well, that's your little brain talking. <laughs> and... As I've talked about quite a bit, there are simple steps you can take to embrace and live with this. And, of course, as I preach quite often, you need to decrease the number of decisions that you're making. But the main thing to know here is there is a physiological part of us that does not jive with trading. And it's very important for you to embrace that. And for me, learning about these things is actually a release. Like, okay, well, that's what's happening. That's why I'm so damn emotional because you can't make a decision without emotion. So wrapping your head around that 
I think it's vitally important, and I encourage you to study that and learn a little bit about that. And the trading world and the real world are two worlds apart. And once you embrace that, and notice I keep using the word embrace, Embracing these things is a first step to solving the problem. And I'm just going to flesh out a couple here just so we can get to the, the meat I want to get into today. But in the real world, you have to have a lot of control. You have to control the situation, and that's what made you successful. In the trading world, obviously, you're dealing with the emotions of not only yourself, but every other person out there. And as I often say, quoting... Mark Douglas, all it takes is one A-hole to screw up a perfectly good trade. So you have no control over that A-hole. Now, that's kind of a blunt way of putting it, but that's, that was kind of like being hit over the head with halibut when he said that on a cassette tape. I don't know if you guys know what a cassette tape is, but I have some cassette tapes from Douglas from back in the 80s. The cassette's this little plastic thing and actually has this tape in there, which is a magnetic little thing. Anyway, showing my age. In the real world, you have to do something. You can't sit on your ass all day unless you're a toll taker. And I shouldn't make fun of toll takers because they're hardworking people. But you get the idea. In trading, it's often a waiting game. There's two types of waiting in trading. You're waiting for the market to be conducive for your methodology. Reminds me of uh, the Dr. Seuss it's a Dr. Seuss book, all the places you will go. Probably one of the best written books on trading psychology ever. But he talks a lot about the waiting place. And read that, read those two pages on waiting. Waiting for the fish to bite, waiting for the wind to fly a kite. Waiting for the snow to snow, the rain to go. <laughs> bus come, bus go. It's pretty good stuff. And you can tell from a lot of my preachings and teachings, I have a big... Dr. Seuss influence, but it is often a waiting game, and you're either, again, waiting for those conditions to be conducive, or once you're in a position, you're waiting for the position to move. I've been working to upload some classic weekend charts. By classic, I mean going back a few years. What I used to do is I used to sum up all these week of charts into a, a, a flash drive and sell them, and they sold, for, they sold like hotcakes for quite a while, but I think everybody who needed one got one. And the selling being the taper off a little bit. And I decided, you know what, I'm just going to go ahead and put them out there in the public domain. So I began to upload them. And every now and then when I think about it, I'll upload a classic week of charts. And one reoccurring theme, and I didn't realize I hit upon it so much, but I do, is the dead money report. Now, dead money is money that has no chances of making any money for you, little or no chances of making any money for you. And if you truly knew there was dead money, then you just get out of position. But with trend following, you don't. So you stick with the position until it's stopped out. But a lot of times it will seem like dead money. A lot of times, a lot of people give up right before the big move happens as opposed to honoring your stop. And I've been there and I've done that and I have the T-shirt for a lot of those type of issues. Now... You must apply a high degree of logic in your life. You don't do something one day on your job and then completely do it a different way. There is a lot of logic, but in the markets, logic doesn't often apply. Now, I'm not saying you want to do something. Uh, let me rewind that. There's a logical way of doing things in your job, and there's a logical way, reason why things happen and how you must deal with them. But in the markets, because markets are emotional, a lot of times they can do very illogical things. And people buy and sell for a variety of reasons, as I often preach, often quoting Tom McClellan's mom. Some people buy when they have money, some people sell when they need money, and others use methods that are far more sophisticated. So logic doesn't always apply. Now, in the real world, you have to be reasonably smart. Otherwise, you'll probably end up digging ditches. 
But in the trading world, because logic doesn't often apply, sometimes you just have to be a moron and follow along. In case you don't know what I mean by that, years ago I was called the trend following moron. And initially I was very hurt because I knew who I knew who it was who said it. And it's somebody I had a lot of respect for. But then I realized, you know, they're fighting the trend and I'm just drawing big blue arrows. So they're not they're not listening to their own psychology and you know what maybe i am just a trend following moron maybe i should give up my ego and trying to hold myself out there as a grand pumba and just a regular guy which i am trying to figure out the markets trying to find a place to get on and trying to hold on as long as possible so that was kind of a a good little, maybe, I don't, want, I don't want to say a turning point, but it was a good epiphany and realization for me. Let go of some of my ego and just be a moron and follow along. Now, in life, obviously, experience is the best teacher. This is a reoccurring lesson that we talk about here quite often. And it is true you'll need a lot of experience, and I'm going to touch upon that in a few minutes. But a lot of times the market can often be a bad teacher. Get out early and you avoid a bigger loss. This might happen 10 times in a row. Let's say you save $1,000 by doing that total. Well, the 11th, the 11th time you get out early, you would have made ten, twenty thousand $20,000 on a trade. So... A lot of times, over the short term, especially, the market will reward bad behavior. On the flip side, let's say you allow your stop to get taken out and you're not going to exit the market. Well, let's say you got a middle stop and the market blows through it and you decide, nope, I'm just going to hang on. And lo and behold, the market comes right back and you end up making a lot of money in a trade. Well, the market just taught you to not use stops. Well, that'll work until it don't. Now, I don't want to beat the dead horse in this because I talk about it so much. Now, along the lines of harder than it looks, I was looking at a week of charts I did last summer. And some of these slides I borrowed from it, you may recognize them. But the market will often fake you out and shake you out. If you're looking at a chart of a trend and you see a nice little Dave Landry setup or somebody else's setup, six months ago like wow look at that it all came from that one little pullback or bow tie or whatever the case may be that's pretty cool well what you don't realize when you're just looking at the chart is there were a lot of zigs and zags along the way markets will often do the most obvious thing but in an unobvious manner and if you think about it like think about breakouts, and I think that's what the, the what the Russell 2000 is trying to do right now. The most obvious thing, in a most unobvious manner, it, instead of just breaking out and breaking out, which it looks like it wants to do, it's going to break out and fake out. It's going to break out and then come right back in. And the corollary to that is a market will do what it has to do to cause the most pain from the most participants. And I got these. Florisms, so to speak, from Linda Rasky. And I asked her, I said, Linda, where did you get these? I said, you know, I quote you often on these. She goes, I never said that. I was like, yes, yeah, you did. She goes, okay, well, I didn't invent that. That's probably a florism from way back in the day when I was on the floor, learning from the more seasoned veterans down on the floor. So I give her credit for that. Now, a corollary from Michael Covell, which I think is a wonderful analogy, as I use quite often, is trend following is like riding a bouncing Bronco. And it is. And that's why I spent a lot of time preaching a hybrid approach to money and position management, where you're taking a short-term gain, but then you're slowly allowing that stop to widen out on the remainder of the position. Now, your position will be on your, at, at your smallest size and your biggest positions, but that's okay. You still have a big enough position on to where when you finally do get stopped out, your open profits drawdown won't be too big. And I recently have gotten some questions on money management. Maybe it's time to do another money management 
type of presentation. Again, what you need to hear versus what you want to hear. As I often joke, I'll probably do a presentation on, or of course I should say on money management, I'll probably sell two. But that's okay. Two people will get. So is it really that hard? And this is probably what my chalkboard, a whiteboard back in the day looked like when I was trying to figure out the markets, doing my grail hunting, waking up a couple hours early every morning and programming for two, three hours before I had to work on any other projects, doing a day to program mechanical trading systems. Well, you can never forget that a market can only exist in three states, period. It's either going up, it's either going down, or it's either going sideways. So if you ever find yourself plotting that 15th oscillator or trying to determine whether it's a third of a fifth or a fifth of a third or some kind of arcane counting method, take a step back, look at the chart, and ask yourself, is it going up? Is it going down? Is it going sideways? Those are the only three states that a market could ever exist in. So my methodology, which if you're wondering if I ever get to get to methodology, I have plenty of videos and articles on actually trading the methodology. So, and you can download archives at a trading service to see the methodology in action or follow along on a delayed basis or a real time basis if you want and see the methodology in action. So I do spend a lot of time talking about the methodology. And in a way, that's kind of the easy part, the methodology. The hard part is actually following it. But if you boil it all down, you could really put my methodology on a cocktail napkin. And basically, we're looking to trade pullbacks and obvious trends or trend transitions, which is a little bit more complicated. But for the most part, we're looking to identify a trend and get on that trend after a pullback. We could be wrong, so we use a stop. And then if things work out, what's missing on here is we will take partial profits. In other words, a swing trade. And then we're going to trail that stop somewhat loosely, or more loosely, I should say, than we did on this swing trade. And that allows us to make the transition to the longer term trend trader. And I hate to use the word hold, but hopefully ride out some of those retracements and bumps along the road that Covell eloquently identified as riding the bouncing Bronco. Now, one thing that you can never forget is that the only way to ever profit on a trade is to capture a trend. You have to sell higher than you buy and you have to short higher than you cover. Now, don't confuse this with buy high or buy low and sell high. Let me rewind that. Don't confuse this with buy low and sell high. If anything, you want to buy high and sell higher. Never forget, it's always darkest right before it gets more dark. So if a stock is headed lower, you do not want to be buying it. It's a simple supply and demand relationship. If a market is headed higher, then there is demand. People are buying. People want to buy. If the market is headed lower, there is supply. People are selling. People want to sell. So never forget that. And again, on every successful trade, you must capture a trend. Now, one slide that I grabbed from last summer was follow is a key word in trend following. As you guys know, I'm a member of the American Association of Professional Technical Analysts. I was a board member a couple years back, so I was pretty involved in the organization. I haven't been as involved lately just because I've been busy. 
but it is an, it is a wonderful organization. It's one of the greatest things that I've done in my career. And Greg Morris was my sponsor, and he's the one who got me in, so I thank him for that. And as I mentioned last summer in a similar presentation, as a trend follower, follow is the key word. And where I'm going with this is you would think through this organization, you would learn all these gee whiz things about technical analysis. And I picked up a few gems along the way. But my biggest revelations and re-revelations and epiphanies and re-epiphanies, if that's a such thing, is that a, a way of looking at the markets in that as a trend follower, you first need a trend to follow. So it's some of these more simpler concepts to wrap your head around that make your life easier as a trader. Well, the only way to ever make money in a market is to capture a trend. Now, if you're a trend follower, as I believe you should be, you will be a little late to the game because that trend's going to have to get started without you before you can get on. You first have to identify a trend and then figure out how you're going to get on it. And unfortunately, as I preach, all trades eventually end badly. In the end, you're going to give up some of that trend even on your best trades in the world. And that's a couple of lectures I've done and several columns I've, columns I've done. It's, it's found its way into the courses. Also is that you will be in a state of regret a lot of the times because that trend will be backing and filling. In other words, going against you. Robert Frey said you spend 75% of your time in a state of regret. Well, I think it's actually quite larger than that. And I told my wife that a while back, and she's like, boy, that explains a lot. <laughs> Why you're so grouchy. And that's another one of those little mild epiphanies. It's like, okay, well, if the market is going against you, guess what? There's a better than average chance, at least 75%, that it will. So you will be a little late to leave. Greg Morris visited a few years back, and I forgot, I've forgot i forgotten exactly what we're talking about. I think we're talking about signals and the importance of signals, and I told Greg that I wrote about some transitional signals that I was seeing and the importance of, of taking the signal seriously, which I quoted him because in, in his fun back when he was running it, he often said, we take all serial signals serious as if it's going to be the big one. And I think I've written a column several times where I got Fred Sanford holding his heart. Oh, it's a big one, Elizabeth. You know, you guys might be old enough to remember that. And during that conversation, he said, well, whipsaws are frustrating. Bear markets are devastating. And you could, you could survive frustration. Now, my new and continuing mission getting back to the path to become a trader is to define the path. As I was finishing up, and I'll show you the last slide here in a few minutes from Trading Full Circle, where I talk about the process of going through your trades. It really got me thinking about my mission as an educator is to define that career path because there is – None when it comes to being a trader. And here's a slide that I ended the trading full circle with. The first thing you want to do is you want to pick the best and leave the rest when it comes to trading. Do you really have the best setup in setup town? Do you really think you have the mother of all setups? Does the sector agree with your analysis? Does the overall market agree with your analysis. In other words, is the overall market headed higher or ideally set up to head higher? And are the stocks within the sector also headed higher and ideally set up? And let's say you're looking at a biotech, for, for example. Have you looked at every other biotech that's tradable within your 
tradable universe within the biotex to see if there was a sexy sister or sexy brother. So have you exhausted all possibilities and have you put all the pieces together? Now, a lot of times all the pieces won't fit, but that's where you have to come back to, do you really, really like the setup? And is it truly the mother of all setups? And you think that even though the sector might not quite be in agreement or the market might be a little choppy, whatever the case may be, some of the pieces don't fit, do you really think that the stock could trade independently of all this? And I have a much bigger decision tree that I go through with a lot of these little things I just talked about. But that's kind of the gist of it. And if you do, you want to plan your trade. And, and as I often preach, the planning phase has to be done after hours. It has to be done when information is static or unchanging. You can't wing it. It's more fun in life to wing it sometimes. But in trading, that's not going to work. And the reason, again, you have to plan while things are static, the reason I say again is because I preach about this often. As Montier once said, when information is changing or uncertain, stress begins to rise. Stress, anxiety, however you want to look at it. Because we, we're not really made to deal with the unknown. But if you make that plan while markets are closed, that market isn't moving and you could plan accordingly. And then I know it's cliche, but all that's left to do is to trade your plan. So plan your trade, trade your plan. Now, here's where you become better. And I've written about this fairly extensively, and I'm a huge fan of this. Malcolm Gladwell and Erickson talk about this quite often. Erickson's done quite a study on it. There's a bit of a rift between those two. But at the end of the day, they're both basically saying the same thing, even though they don't realize it. But you need to work to get better. That's what deliberate practice is. It's not just practicing. It's working to get better at what you're doing. So in the postmortem, you rewind your trade back to where you, back before the day you got in, and you say, was this a great setup? Was the sector also trending? Was the overall market, overall market trending? Was there any other stock within the sector that looked better? So it's almost like you have to start the whole process over again. And you have to be careful, of course, not to use a little hindsight. You have to be brutally honest. And that's a hard thing for us to do. We have a lot of autonomy in this business. We have 100% autonomy. And in a lot of other businesses, you don't have that. You have checks and balances that are done by other people to keep you from effing up. You have a co-pilot if you're a pilot, I suppose. You have lots of checks and balances in life. But you don't necessarily have that in trading unless you're willing to implement them themselves. So... Heavy is the head that wears a crown. You have all the freedom in the world, but that can get you into a lot of trouble. So you have to do the postmortem and you have to be brutally honest. And every now and then, and I don't do it as often as I used to, but every now and then you'll think, what the hell was I thinking? Well, don't beat yourself up if you feel that way. That's good. That means you're actually learning because you realize you took a trade you should not have taken. Now, a lot of times I'll have the mother of all setups and I just know it's going to work. And sometimes it does, but sometimes it doesn't. And when I do that postmortem and I'm like, you know what? If I saw this tomorrow, even though I know that I lost my ass on the trade, I would still take that trade. And that's when I think you're reaching the true enlightenment is when you could say, you know what, I would have taken it, even though in perfect hindsight it didn't work. If I saw the same exact trade tomorrow, I would take it. I think that's when it really begins to click. Now, you need to rinse and repeat. And as I often say, and I've written a complete column on this, the first step to becoming successful in trading 
is to plan your trade and trade your plan and just do it for one trade. Now, as I often preach, I'm not a tough love kind of guy. But maybe I've done a disservice to some of you people by not being a tough love kind of guy. So as I'm getting a little older, I'm getting a little bit more crouchy. And I'm beginning to have this realization that maybe I need to be a little bit more of a tough love kind of guy. I had somebody a while back. And I know he's been emailing me for over 10 years. And it's like he's still... Same old bull s, <laughs> you know. It's like same old. Oh, wow, wow, wow! I'm not doing this, and I'm not doing this, and I know I'm not doing this, but I'm not. It's like, you know, I should have cut him off six, seven, eight years ago because I've been nurturing, nurturing this guy on. Now this is going back five or six years. So if you think it's you, it's not. Um, I, I actually finally cut him off. I just got sick of it. But if you can't do it for one trade, then maybe you shouldn't be trading. That's where the tough love comes in. But if you want to do it, you can. You just have to do it. Now, let's talk about that process. Obviously, it's mine or trading psychology, money management, and methodology. You'll have to study these things. And this is where I come in and I think I can help. And we'll come back to that in a few minutes. But you have to find a simple methodology that fits your psyche and lifestyle. Now, there's a lot to be there's a lot that's said here. First of all, it has to be simple. A simple methodology is going to be a lot easier to follow than a more complex one. A more complex methodology could quite possibly have curve fit itself to prior markets. And the one thing I can guarantee is that curve is going to look different in the future. So I would much rather have an imperfect, mediocre methodology, which I guess my methodology is because it's imperfect and it doesn't always print money. If the market is in a rip-roaring uptrend, it does. And in some cases, if it's dropping like a stone and following through, it does on the short side. But a lot of times it doesn't. And wrapping your head around that is something that's a little hard to do. But it can be done. But find something simple and go from there. What's uh, Leonardo da Vinci said, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. It has to fit your psyche and your lifestyle. If it goes against what you believe in, then you won't be able to do it. Now, I did meet a trader once who actually hired a guy to trade a system that he could not trade because it just made him crazy. And he told the guys, like, okay, I'm going to pay you to trade the system. But the moment you stop following the system is the moment I'm going to, file, I'm going to fire you. Well, we don't. We all don't have that luxury to hire somebody to trade something that we can't trade personally. I think you'd be better off just finding something that you could trade personally. Now, it has to fit your lifestyle, too. I knew a doctor who had a brief stint of carrying a laptop from exam room to exam room and trying to day trade while being a doctor. You're either going to either be a really bad day trader or a really bad doctor, and you're probably going to be both. You'll probably do both badly. So it does have to fit your lifestyle. Now, I'm here 12 hours a day, and I've committed my life to this. But following and running the methodology and the trading is a very small part of that 12 hours a day. Well, maybe a couple hours a day is a research for the next trading day. But other than that, you know, a few seconds of place in order, and 99% of the time, I'm not in there firing off trades. If I watch a screen, I will be. I can guarantee you that. 99% of the time, I'm keeping myself busy doing other things, so I don't fire off a trade, and I've talked about this quite often. So as I often say, at least when it comes to my methodology, I think a busy trader 
makes a good trader. It doesn't have to be a mutually exclusive decision. You could keep your current job and still trade. As I said at nauseam, recently I got a call from somebody, Dave, I'm getting a lot better at my trading. Well, congratulations. Would you? What's your epiphany? Because I didn't have an epiphany. My doctor who was covering the hospital quit. I'm too damn busy now. Now I got to cover the hospital plus my own practice. I'm only taking opportunities when the best opportunities come along. I'm no longer micromanaging myself. I'm Once I get into these longer term trend trades, I'm just letting them run. And you know what? You're right. You're better off just letting everything work and not micromanaging and not day trading and not trying to guess the top or catch the bottom and all these other bad behaviors that you might be tempted to do if you're sitting there watching your screen. So make sure it fits your lifestyle. Again, getting back to my stuff, you really only need to pay attention a few minutes around the open, and then you can go about your life. Place your orders, maybe set some alerts. In some cases, you can use hard stops. I don't suggest you completely mechanize everything, but you could certainly automate it to a level to where you're not doing a whole lot. And, and the ideal trade is to catch a longer term trend. We had one triggered in January, I think. We're still in. So what we're you know what's it's uh almost August. So we're what seven months into the trade? Well there's nothing to do. There's rarely anything to do with this position anymore. So focus your energies on your business or your loved ones or go and do something fun and just let that trade unfold. Now, until you find something, you might have to go back to the books. And I have some thoughts on that in just a few minutes. Now, once you think you do find something, begin to paper trade it over a variety of conditions. Once real money is on the line, it's going to be a lot more difficult. Now, you could, if you are going to paper trade it, make sure you're emailing yourself the trades so you have a timestamp on it or find a broker that has a simulator and do some simulated trading. Uh, I'm not affiliated with HowTheMarketWorks.com, but I've written about stock picking contests that people have approached me for help with. And I really helped them kick ass because most of the people in the concept in the contest are doing what? They're buying the Walmarts of the world, the Netflix of the world, the Amazons, the Apples, the obligatory Apple. Not that these stocks can't move, but they're just blindly buying them because they think they're quote unquote good companies, as opposed to buying something a little bit more obscure that's moving. So once you start paper trading. Make sure you paper trade it over a variety of conditions. Now, if you're successful in that paper trading, which, as I often say, I've never met an unsuccessful paper trader, but if you're not successful, then you got to go back to the books and you got to figure out what that methodology is going to be. And I'm going to flesh that out in just one second. So if you are successful at paper trading, then begin putting real money on the line. Now, this is where all the psychological issues begin to rear their ugly head because of our attachments to money, because we monetize trades quite often. And we try to interject logic as opposed to just being a trend following moron and following along. Now, you will have to experience a variety of conditions. I've had clients start doing bull markets, do incredibly well, print money pretty much, quit a business in one particular case I could think of, tell a boss to F off or whatever, because this trading thing is so damn easy. But then first bear market comes along and it's a very much a rude awakening. So there is no career path well-defined career path or is there yes there is and that path is time find something simple and give yourself some time experience a variety of conditions i've had clients start one in particular i don't i don't think there's that many but i can think of one that started during the bear market his first trade was a short 
believe it or not, I, I can't imagine your first trade being a short because I remember when I first started trading, a short kind of like blew my mind. It took me a while to wrap my head around this. How can I sell something that I don't own? I got to borrow it. Isn't that stealing? It took me a little while to figure it out. But his first trade was a short. And this was back in 2000. And he shorted like no tomorrow. He shorted everything on my list. He shorted his own stocks. And he got it. He made a lot of money. But what happened when the market began to turn up? Well, instead of paying attention to the buys, the transitions, back in March of 2000, was it March 2000? March 2009, I think, with the market turn, memory serves. He kept shorting. He thought, well, the market's higher. Well, now it's it's good. I can short it even more. And I don't know. I don't know the Paul Horby rest of the story there. But usually, when somebody prints money and disappears, it's usually not a good thing. I rarely get a postcard a couple of years later from the Bahamas or wherever they're sailing, telling me how great they're doing. Usually, I never hear from them again, which means that something bad happened. Now, once you're trading at a small size and have experienced a variety of conditions, can you actually follow the system? And I know I've kind of beat the dead horse on this. Imagine, imagine that, me beating a dead horse. I had somebody a while back email me a system. I'm like, well, you know, you had a 50% drawdown. Yeah, but by the end of the year, it was profitable. Well, could you really lose half of your money and keep trading? Nothing wrong with systems like that. I was in a... Uh, one of these weekend charts, one of you guys pointed out someone, and I don't want to, I don't want to say his name because it, it's going to sound a negative, but somebody who runs a, a fund, and he has these horrendous drawdowns, but he also has these tremendous returns. So, could you actually trade a system with a horrendous drawdown? And the only way you can find that out is to actually do it through a variety of conditions. And unfortunately, again, you're going to have to go back to the books if you can't. Now, I'm making it sound quite elusive, but you could just take one simple pattern, something like maybe TKOs, trend knockouts, which I have plenty of videos on on my website, and possibly also make sure you trade those in accelerated trends. And then when you're starting out, trade more of the textbook variety ones. And you can ask me, you can shoot me an email within reason and say, hey, Dave, is this a textbook TKO? And I'll give you a thumbs up, a thumbs down or a high five. But you can follow something really simple, like one simple pattern. Linda Rasky once said, all you need is one pattern to be successful. Well, Linda's right. Follow just one pattern. If you're, if you're not successful with one pattern, what makes you think you're going to be successful with 10? So, again, go back to the books, but it doesn't have to be that hard. It could be just one simple pattern. Now, if you're trading at a small size, let's say a half a percent per trade, if stopped out, then you can gradually increase that size. You don't want to step on the gas and go to 2%, which is my max. You'll want to do that overnight. You might want to bump it to three quarters of a percent. Do that for a while until you hit an uptrend, a downtrend, a sideways trend, go through the motions again, and then gradually increase your size up to that 2%. And as you're increasing your size, can you continue to follow along? And if not, go back to the books. And I guess in this case, if you made it this far, maybe this arrow should be pointing more back to back off. But the problem is you want to be consistent in this size. And I, I did a whole presentation on this, but let's say you're at a half a percent. Don't jump to 2% and lose and then go to half percent, half percent, half percent, because you can end up in a downward spiral. You want to go from one half percent to three quarters of a percent. Okay. Maybe this is a dozen trades here. And if you're successful overall, then go to 1% and then so on and so forth. But you need to reach a point where you can actually follow it. Now, if you're out trading and you're only I, I, I met somebody a while back who who knew the business but wasn't a trader and he started trading and he was successful. And I'm like, well, I've never seen someone have, even though they were exposed to the business, they weren't on the trading side of the business, they were on the business side of the business, I guess. 
And I asked him, I was like, well, how, how could you be successful because you really haven't been doing the actual trading? He's like, well, Dave, I'm risking $25 a trade. Now, he, I don't know how or what markets he was trading. We didn't get into all that. But he must have been trading like a micro contract on on Forex or something. I don't know what he was exactly was doing, but he was risking twenty, literally twenty five dollars a trade. And he's like, Psh, you know, what's twenty five dollars? Who cares? Well, you have to get like that in your trading, and a lot of times, it, unless you get the repetitions in, in other words, get the trade the plan, follow the plan in, unless you do that over and over and over again, you're not going to be able to do it. So it's kind of like a catch-22 situation. Well, the way you do it, the way you build that muscle, so to speak, is to trade at a very small size that's almost meaningless. All right, some random thoughts on, on hitting the books on mind, money management, and methodology. The first thing I would tell you trying to define this career path is to give yourself some time. You saw that plumber career back there. That's, what was it? I mean, forget about your basic education because 90% of us, I guess I'll have that. But the professional education was years. And that's to be a plumber. And I don't want to take anything away from being a plumber because it is a skill. And realize there's no holy grail and and that was kind of a bittersweet day for me is when i finally came to that conclusion i mean i knew there wasn't i think deep down but i certainly was searching for it waking up really early and programming for hours and hours a day and i'd go home and tell my wife about all these systems i created she would suffer a fool gladly until one day she's like how many systems do you really need i'm like well shit you just need one you need the one that you're going to follow now, the problem that a lot of us have is that we get on these mailing lists, either intentionally or otherwise, that have all these inflated claims. And one of them that I talked about in Trading Full Circle is two to four, make 2 two to 4% a day. Well, shit, okay, that sounds pretty good. That sounds almost plausible until you do the math on it. And at, let's say, 4% compounded daily, on a $10,000 account, your account would be worth $181 million by the end of the year. If I could turn $10,000 into $181 million in one year, you'd never see my fat ass again. Well, you might. I'd come back and taunt you a second time. But believe me, it's not that easy. And the other thing that comes up quite a bit, and I'm actually reading a book now. I don't want to take it away from take anything away from this person, but his claim to fame was he turned a small sum of money into a large sum of money in 1999. Well, could he do it today? No, because conditions are not that conducive, and there's been a few. Claim the fames on the internet, you know who they are, who claim to have done these incredible things. In some cases, it may be true. In some cases, it's it's complete and utter BS just because I've been around the business long enough and I know I know a guy who knows a guy. I had one guy who was out there claiming to be the grand poobah, and his lead technical analyst would call me and ask me a lot of questions about the markets. And I'm thinking, like, well, why don't you talk to the grand poobah? You work for him. So... I better stop because that story's going to give me a lot of trouble. But anyway, that's a two drink venom type of story. But if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. I was listening to a webinar a while back. I was ready to pull up my credit card by the end of it. You know, for $9.97, they would have shown me how I could take $10K and turn it to 100K. And then they literally said this and then quit your job and then turn it into 500K. Turn to 100K to 500K. And somebody, somebody said, can I, can I do it with 5K? It's like, oh, of course. So it's like, well, shit, if you could, if you could turn 500 to 500K, then open up 10 accounts, and then what would you have? $10 million, $5 million? So beware of that. Be willing to accept a robust yet imperfect system.
And I think that's what I have is something that's fairly robust, but I'm not splitting the atom. And a lot of this I didn't invent. And, and back in 99, I remember some guy pulled me aside. He goes, he goes, man, that pullback thing you invented, put two of my daughters through college. And I'm like, it's like, look, I didn't invent the pullback. I just like them and I've embraced them. So realize that your system is probably going to be imperfect. It will be imperfect no matter what. In fact, beware of a too perfect system because it's doomed to fail. And just embrace and accept it. Don't reinvent the wheel. It's not my way or the highway. But a lot of people study my stuff a little bit. And then they start telling me about all these systems they're working on and everything they're doing. And they're not trading successfully yet, but they're building all these systems. And they're asking for my input on them. And I'm like, well, look, I've been working on this for 20 something years and it is a work in progress. That's why I'm using the word work. Why not take some of the stuff that I discovered do it for yourself, become successful doing that. And then, of course, you know, put your own spin on it and, and find out what works for you and make adjust it to you. But there's no need to reinvent the wheel. And it doesn't have to be me. Again, you know, you're sitting here listening to me today, all this pontification. It could be somebody else's stuff, but there's no need to reinvent the wheel. Yes, do your research and go out looking to see what's out there on your own but start with a base start with simple trend following start with identifying trends start with trading pullbacks and then once you're successful at that learn how to recognize trend transitions so that a you recognize the next bear market when it comes along and b you recognize when when gold's bottoming out or silver's bottoming out or whatever's at low levels now and begins to turn or whatever's at high levels like the airlines recognize when they've topped out and then build and build and build keep the pressure off that's one thing i was thinking about last night as i was reading one of these aforementioned books is that because of the autonomy we have the only pressure we can put on ourselves is the only pressure that we give ourselves so you don't have a boss in this business, which is great. Again, heavy is the head, right? That wears a crown. So any pressure that you're putting on yourself, you created yourself. And I know it's kind of tough to live with. But if you're going to give yourself, number one, ample amount of time, and number two, educate yourself properly over an ample amount of time, and number three, experience a variety of conditions, Paper trade, small trade, build your size, trade the plan, follow the plan, and do all these things. Then you'll do just fine, but you can't put pressure on yourself. The other thing I would recommend is to be realistic. How well are the greatest money managers in the world doing? Poke around the internet a little bit and see what these big hedge funds are doing. And read all these books about all these famous traders and et cetera. But one thing you'll discover in that process is that some of these world famous people might be returning something like 20% a year. In fact, if you could consistently make 20% a year with reasonable drawdowns, and you went into the money management business and could do that consistently, you probably would do fairly well as a money manager. You probably have all the money in the world you want to manage. Now, money management business is a very tough business to get into and all, but the point is assuming that all of the hurdles that it takes to, to do that, you could get over all those. If you could consistently have those kind of returns with reasonable drawdowns, then you would be very, very, very successful. But a lot of people like, well, I got $20,000. I want to quit my job and trade. What do you need to live? Uh, I don't know, 40000 <laughs> I 
okay, so you're going to have to make 200% a year and you're not going to have any capital growth on that. It's just a tremendous amount of pressure to put yourself under. But if you have a day job and you're position trading, then you can do quite well over time and you don't have to put that pressure on yourself. Personally, I do not believe paper trading is worth anything. I would suggest starting small and always with real money. Actual trade entry and platform experience or the one hand and emotion comes with real money you need to learn. Well, yeah, I hear you, Phil. And, and you know, I, I'm just being – I'm going to err on the side of being overly cautious. And if you're using a tracking service or if you have a broker that allows simulated trading, then you're actually doing some – some some of that execution type of process. But yes, I hear you, and that that sometimes is a missing piece is the is the actual execution. Um I mean just recently I, I put in an order and and it to me it was logical on a Forex trading system. To me it was logical, it should have worked as a stop, but it did not. When the order got hit, it actually got immediately canceled. It would have been nice for them to tell them tell me that ahead of time, but I didn't realize that that was wrong. So, yes, there is some of that executional thing you'll have to find out. And guess what? I dropped some F-bombs when I came in the next morning. I had a big loss on my hands that was only supposed to be a very small loss. So, yes, it happens. You will have to go through the execution. The real world and the trading world are two different places. The paper trading world and the real trading world or two different places. So I hear you on that, Phil. Can't argue with you. Um, but I would encourage you to still do the paper trading first. And then when you do the real trading, you're trading at such a small size, it's meaningless. I mean, one thing I hate to tell people to do because it's such a tough market, but it's like I almost want to tell people in order to learn how to trade first, I think the ultimate opportunities are going to be in the somewhat smaller cap stocks or large cap stocks when it comes to shorting when the time is right. But the big opportunities, the really big opportunities are in the small to medium cap stocks that are more inefficient than the larger cap stocks. All these things I often preach about when they take off and go up 100 percent or 200 percent or more or something like IPOs, which can make a very large, inefficient move over a very short period of time. In other words, all these things aren't priced in. And that's what I would encourage you to trade. That's where the money is. But to get those repetitions in, and I hate to even say this, but maybe fund a, a Forex account with a very small amount of money and just trade the charts there on a very micro basis where you're only risking, say, $25 or $50 a trade, and just do that till it bores you silly. And win, lose, a draw, just get used to going through the ups and downs of making a little, losing a little, and then work into trading stocks. So it's like I've been really hesitant to say that. I probably shouldn't have said it, but I think it's something that can be done. I'm trying to figure out a way for you to get your reps in without losing your ass. And of course, if you're paper trading, that doesn't cost anything. All right, a couple of announcements, and we'll hop into the charts. Still rolling out the learning management system. So far, so good. A lot of people are uh, participating in that through Trading Full Circle course, and a lot of good feedback on that. By learning management means that you have the video, you take a quiz, you pass the quiz. Once you, success, once you succeed in that, then you move on to the next video. I can track your progress. I can see where you are. I'm not playing Big Brother. But if you have trouble, then it's like, well, OK, you need to go back and rewatch this. Or if there's something that's missing, I could certainly go in and add it in. But uh, that's continuing to roll out. I'm not sure where the, what the next step in that is for as a course or a membership or whatever is going to be. But it's in the back of my mind. But the course is live, trading full circle. So if you want to start watching the base videos, that's 100 percent free. And you can get that on the website. All right. Any questions, David, Dave, Leonard .com, And then obviously. My website, DaveLandry.com. Let's hop into the charts. If you guys want to start asking about individual stocks, you can do so now. Please do so, I should say. <laughs> and then I'll just uh, give you a thumbnail of the overall market. We'll take a look at some sector action, and then we'll take a look at your stock picks. 
All right, let's start with the S&P 500. First of all, don't argue with all-time highs as a trend follower, okay? If you go back in a few months ago, I'm trying to think when it was. I think it was back here on this day here. I'm pretty sure. Go back and read my column from right around then. And there was a guru out there. Call the top, 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 call the top. And then the market sells off one big day. And he's like, ah, I told you. <laughs> well, predict early and often, okay? And if you were just tuning into the guru on the day before it slid, you'd think, wow, this guy's a genius. But he was wrong for a long, long time fighting that trend. So don't fight the trend. You're not going to look smart in the end, but don't fight the trend. Hey, you might want to write that down. So peas are at all-time highs. Let's not argue with them. Ideally, I'd like to see this accelerate out of this little base that it's coming out of, but so far so good, I'm not going to complain. I do think it's possible that new highs could beget more new highs. And the reason is people get people feel left out and they feel like they're being left behind and they get forced in. Now, sometimes that creates a, per, a parabolic type of move if everybody rushes in in the end. And that's that's the behavior of markets. Sometimes that'll happen. You'll get a blow off type of move. And that's what that causes that where everybody and their brother just feel like they have to be in and then the market tops. But right now, I think new highs can to get new highs. And, and I talked to somebody who was like way back in, I forget when, maybe middle of 2016 or something. And and they sold and the market was making new highs. And I'm like, well, you know, why would you sell? The market's making new highs. He's like, well, because it's high. So, so you're saying I should get back in? Should I wait for it to go down and then get back in? It's like, no, I, I think you should be in because the market is making new highs. So he's probably still sitting on his hands. And then eventually he's going to be forced in. NASDAQ composite, decent day today, up what, half percent? And this is the acceleration I'm looking for. Now it's just one morning so far. So let's say I, had two, let's say I get too excited, he tried to say. Um, ideally, I like to see it break out more like that. But I'm not going to complain as long as the market is banging out new highs in here. It's good to see it out of this range. Let's take a look at the Rusty. Now, Rusty score is a bit of a bummer, as I said this morning, because it broke out, came right back in, and now it's it looks okay today. What did I say earlier? Market will do the most obvious thing in the most unobvious manner. So this Russell really looks like it wants to break out. Of course, it's going to have a lot of little fits and starts along the way. But so far, so good. Now, some of the sectors are banging out new highs in here, like software, as you can see, and that's certainly a good thing. One sector I like to watch a lot, or carefully, I should say, is the semiconductors. My only concern with the semiconductors, even though we're at new highs, let's not complain too much, is they do have a slight bit of a V-shaped recovery look to them. My only problem with a V-shaped recovery is that by the time you get all the way back to your old highs, in other words, right here, you're already overbought. So it's it's hard for an overbought market to push through that overbought condition. Doesn't mean I'm calling a top. I would call a top there, but so far it looks okay. I'm getting a message that my audio went out. Looks like it's working again, so I'm gonna keep. Uh, I'm gonna keep presenting. Now, metals and mining has been doing pretty good as of late. Shorter term, it looks phenomenal. Intermediate term, it looks phenomenal. You back the chart out a little bit, though. You can see we're kind of at these mid levels in here. I'd much prefer if we were coming off of major, major lows and make it a transition as opposed to where we are now. So the transition right here, I'm not as excited about. 
as I would be if it was coming from major, major lows. Now, if they start banging out brand new highs or multi-year highs, I should say, maybe up in here, then I might start getting a little bit more excited about metals and mining. But some areas like steel, iron, copper, aluminum, doing pretty well. And then some areas like the golds, as you can see, not doing as well. The reason I say goals, yeah, nope, yeah, we, we did lose down. <laughs> but some areas like gold, as you can see, in a bit of a slide as of late. And you certainly don't want to rush out and buy the gold stocks. The reason I said gold, that's the gold stocks. Now, banks are kind of interesting because banks were topping. And then they turned around and went right back up. And then now they're coming back in a little bit. But so far, so good. Oh, we got sound back. And that concludes the secret of trading. <laughs> um, as you look through the sectors, for the most part, most look pretty good. There's insurance. Drugs were doing really well, but now they're beginning to stall out a little bit. Biotech looks a little bit better within the drugs. I'm still a bit of a biotech bull. I have to be careful because I've always had the biotech bug, and I've always kind of liked the biotech sector. So I have to believe in what I see and not in what I believe. But right now, I believe that they're headed higher because they're at new highs. So, so far, so good there. Drugs are a little disappointing, like I said a second ago. I don't know if the sound was working then. Um, health services has been looking pretty good, but now it's beginning to pull back a little bit. It's certainly losing a little bit of steam. So as you go through these sectors, you can see it's kind of mixed throughout. Retail, which looks like it was headed lower, is now coming back with a vengeance. So that's certainly a good deal. Uh, yeah, keep the stock picks coming. Transports are looking pretty dubious at best. And you can see with today's action, not looking so hot. And a lot of that's being led lower by the major airlines. Now, as I often joke, one day I'm going to build the system for trading airlines, and basically the system is two rules. One, wait for them to go up, and then two, short them. <laughs> it's just a horrible business. But let's just, for s and Gs, let's take a look at the sub-industry here and see what's going on. So you can see that some of these airlines have rolled over, such as Delta, which could provide us a shorting opportunity fairly soon. Not a big fan of shorting when the market's headed higher, but it looks like these guys are in trouble, and sometimes you get an opportunity in an area like this. Okay, let's get back to the sectors, and then we'll finish up. Bonds, that's what I was looking for. Now, bonds are a slight bummer in here because they've been sliding as of late. Now, as I often preach, I'm sick of myself saying it, but it's not the absolute level of bonds that matters. I mean, if longer term up in here in the 120s, that's still ridiculously high. But it's the delta, the change in, in bonds that's concerning. Like when you see a big drop like we had back here. Just for fun, let's see if we could put the S&P overlay that so I could show you what I'm talking about. Uh, you have to be super duper careful with intermarket technical analysis because there's long lead and lag times. And in more recent years, I remember when I first got started in this business, if you could get the direction of bonds right, you could trade stocks and vice versa, and there's a lot of things that you could do. But nowadays, it seems that intermarket technical analysis only matters when it matters. So as you can see, when you got a pretty serious slide in bonds, you had a pretty serious slide in stocks because bonds down yields up. And you can see there's a bit of an inverse correlation here. Now, if bonds begin to implode, not that it's going to be like, that higher rates, even if you drop down down here, it wouldn't be that high. But the delta or the change in bonds could spook the stock market a little bit. So keep an eye on bonds for sure. All right, let's go ahead and jump into some stocks here. Andre wants to talk about the dollar. The dollar looks like it's in a downtrend. I've been short uh, the dollar Canadian for a long, long time. 
And to those who trade currencies, it's usually a pretty calm currency, usually hard to make money because it doesn't move a lot. But as you can see, dollar in a pretty serious downtrend. So I would be looking to sell the dollar in here or short the dollar. So maybe on a bounce. Now keep in mind an efficient market like the dollar is going to be much harder to trade than an inefficient market such as a smaller cap stock. But yeah, Andre, I think the dollar is headed lower for sure. IPI, that's going to be what? Potash. Um, let's zoom in a little bit. Well, it's making new highs. I, I hear you, Phil. It has a bit of a Phoenix characteristic to it. By Phoenix, I mean that it's rising from the ashes. Um, I don't see a setup here, but I hear you. Maybe uh, if it continues higher to break out on a pullback. And then your next big area resistance would be 14, which that would be a good problem to have. Make three or four or five hundred percent on a trade. Now, by Phoenix, I mean rise from the ashes and possibly return to its old glory. And in this case, that would be 50 something dollars a share. Sometimes what happens is a stock falls from grace, and some of this reasoning comes from Dick Fruth, and uh, some of it is a lot of what I found empirically. I started calling them Phoenix stocks, and then I noticed that uh, Dick Fruth did a lot of um, research, and he actually gave a few speeches to the APTA about them. But what happens is when a stock gets at low levels, people finally give up. People finally throw in the towel. You have tax loss selling. That happens. You have people that die, unfortunately. People get married. And in some cases, unfortunately, <laughs> people get divorces and the estates have to be settled and stocks get sold. And in the meantime, maybe the company can reinvent itself. Maybe the company can pay off some debt or just generally get their act together. Not that you want to interject fundamentals into it, but sometimes when you have these very long multi-year bases at low levels, stocks can take off and go much higher. Right now, I wouldn't jump in and trade it, but if it could break out, maybe pullbacks. Now, if you wanted to, you could use a three-point stop, and it could be an option that never expires, which I actually did a speech on a while back. Um, the problem with buying a stock at $3 and using a zero stop is that you're counting on the stock to never go out of business. And in a lot of cases, once they get this low, sometimes they can continue to go out of business. But wait, Dave, I thought you were talking about buying these Phoenix stocks. Well, I am, but only on a pattern. I think the best way to trade this would be let it break out above these highs in here to hit multi-year highs, two to three-year highs, and then play the um, pullbacks. 10 bag, you started buying at 130. Oh, interesting. Oh, cool. All right. I want you, where, what was your pattern back then? I know you're a technical guy, so I know you weren't just bottom fishing. Oils. Well, I think it's a little early for oils. You answered your own question on that, John, but let's take a look at, but I hear you. I think some of those are beginning to bottom out. I think oils could be the mother of all opportunities. We're just not there yet. Um, if you take a look at the, let's take a look at energy overall real quick. Again, when it, especially when it comes to something like commodities, I would much rather prefer them coming off of major lows like we had in 2016. And when was that bottom before that? Uh, 2009, I think we had some tremendous opportunities in the energies. Let's see. Yeah, 2009, we had tremendous opportunities. 2016, we caught a few. I think we caught CNX is one of them. But getting back to your stock. Oh, let me. I'm sorry. Let me just rewind that one second. With the energies and other commodities, I, I like them on the fringe a lot more. So for me to be excited about energies, I'd almost like to see them make new highs to be a trend follower or to go bottom out to be a transitional player. So yeah, in some cases it might be too early, but let's just see. Yeah, you're definitely too early on CRC. Let's take a look at a bow tie. Uh, maybe on a bow tie, if it comes together, bow ties, it might be worth a shot. Let's see what the sector is at that point in time. But I hear you. Now, it does have some 
oh, bad memories back here. Now I know it traded above that and then back below. So some of that might be washed out. So it looks okay, but maybe wait for that bow tie to form and then let's check back. CLR. Now here's another possible bow tie, but I'd much prefer a bow tie coming off of major lows like the one back here. And by the way, for the setup junkies, bow ties and the free reports, if you want a free report on trading the bow tie pattern. I just prefer them off of major, major lows like that, 2016 all-time low, I think, for this one, as opposed to just a, a one-year low. But I hear you. It could form a bow tie. You would have some problems and resistance around 42. I think I'd pass on this one based on the fact that it has this overhead resistance here. But, yeah, of course, wait for a setup. AKCA, I'm long that stock too, so full disclosure. This is an IPO. Um, it triggered a buy it B IPO pattern, and I think it also triggered the Dave Landry's moving average pattern. I haven't figured out what I'm going to call it yet. I've gotten a few suggestions, so thank you. So if you're following the moving average pattern, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. This day here would have got you long right around there. But it's closing at a new high. You know, the beauty of an IPO, as I often say, is you can take a Will Rogers approach. You want to buy the ones that go up. If they don't go up, don't buy them. Give me an example, Dave. Well, APRN. I need to write about this one. I haven't gotten around to doing it. You know, which way is it headed? Come on. Don't take a rocket scientist. It's headed lower. Snap crap, okay? And that's how I came up with that little simple moving average system was, okay, I wanted to show everyone a little system, simple system using snap crap. And let's take a look at what snap crap did, okay? They don't go up, don't buy them, okay? AKCA. Look at that. What's it doing? It's going up. Buy it. <laughs> Put your best clients in it. Of course I'm long. Uh, yeah, this looks good. This is what I've been watching. Um, it is a little wide and loose longer term. One of my hangups with this, this has actually been in a Landry list. I shouldn't be mentioning it, but I guess I can. Um, I prefer if it wasn't, wasn't dealing with this prior little peak in here, but over the short term, I have to agree with you. And this is one that's been on a list for a while. It looks pretty good. There's quite a few caveats with it though. I'd almost like to see a little bit more pullback. I prefer if it was taking out the prior highs in here more decisively. Keep in mind with the market right at new highs, it's not the overall market. You're not going to see that many setups. And that's why if you look at my trading service today, I'm going to give you today's setup. You ready? Nothing. Okay. There's nothing that I think we should be going after. Head and shoulders and what, Phil? SPWR? Well, you've got a big gap here, and I know that's a long time ago, but still could be a problem. Um, is this a solar stock? I mean, I hear you. It's it's generally headed higher, but I think I would pass. Let's see if I can find something better. I don't like it trading into this big gap. Let's see what Tan's doing. Yeah, here's your ETF for solars, which looks pretty good shorter term, but intermediate term, you've got a lot, or longer term, you've got a lot of overhead supply to deal with. So you've got a nice little breakout. I'd like to see some correction here, maybe like a double top knockout type of move, DTKO. Oh, IPI was a series of nested, nested head of Jodas. Yeah, I don't trade off of... Um, Big picture patterns, but I do incorporate them into what I do. But I hear you. For instance, a head and shoulder top might turn out to be a gatekeeper or a bow tie or a first thrust. But I'm going to wait for that gatekeeper, bow tie, or first thrust to happen. And then I'm going to say, oh, yeah, it's also a head and shoulder. So I got that working for me. IMGM, got a couple of time for a couple of more, so get them in now, just so I have them. Yeah, this is one I've been watching, too. It does have some bad memories along the way. Let's zoom in a little bit. I think I would pass now, though, because it's, it's pulled back all the way back to where it broke out. 
And then now you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. You had about three weeks worth of trading without making a new high. So it hasn't rallied out of that big pullback just yet. So I think I'd leave that one alone. I don't know why I say think. I know. <laughs> I know I'd leave that one alone. All right, any final questions? AYX, light volume, new issue, long. AYX. Yeah, it is kind of thin. Um, I hear you. It broke out, came in. So it's it looks okay. Uh, maybe put it on your watch list. But, yeah, very thin, thinly traded stock. So you'd have to be really careful. But, yeah, I think we talked about the, the, the moving average pattern in this one. See this little, little mark here? That would have been the day you got – long based on that pattern but it looks okay a little more volume maybe cldr that's a blast from the past if i can get it to come up yeah let's see well you do have a big gap to deal with I think I would pass because you've got this gap in overhead supply to deal with. Now, I do like the Phoenix pattern kind of on a compressed basis with IPOs, but I like it when it looks a little bit more like this, like an IPO comes public and then it just kind of sells off and then bottoms out for a while, begins to take off. Uh, my problem with that one is you've got like a, a lot of trading gap down and then it's getting ready to go into that overhead supply so you've got people that might be looking to get off the hook so i would pass on that but i hear you it looks okay as for as short a term you got a nice thrust from lows it's probably also a bow tie or close enough but yeah i would pass on that based on the bad memories for now for me to go back after this one i would wait for it to get above 23 and then go out go at it again avo i know that one Yeah, too many days of the pullback. Uh, but and then also it's a, it's a bit of a bottle rocket like I drew in from last week. You asked about this one last week, didn't you? I could tell. Uh, it shot higher, went up like 400%. What's that move? Uh, let's measure it. Yeah, 400% round number. Pretty good eyeball in there, Dave. And then a lot of times you end up with a bottle rocket situation to come right back in. So I would leave that one alone. BLFS? Oh, it's super thin. Too thin. Somebody's long BLFS. <laughs> Andre, are you long BLFS? It's kind of all over the place longer term, but I hear you. Short to intermediate term. Looks like it's got it tacked together. It's taken off. Um, fairly volatile. It looks okay, just way too thin. CPRX. Got time for one more. Yeah, this one, it's kind of a funky bow tie, but I hear you it kind of uh, made a bow tie down. Let's see what's happening longer term. And it does have some bad memories over here, but it looks okay. But it's already triggered, so let it see if it can make new highs and then re-trigger or, or re-form uh, a new setup. Well, look, I'm out of time. Uh, as usual, thank you guys and girls for coming. I appreciate you taking time and a busy schedule to be here. As you can tell, I love doing these shows, and I will continue to do them as long as you show up. Any unanswered questions, Dave, at DaveLandry.com. We don't talk between now and then. Everybody have a great weekend. I hope to see all you guys and girls again next week. You're welcome, Joe. You're welcome, Andrea.